Well, good morning. Would you pray again with me as we turn our attention to God's word and ask for his help together this morning? Oh, Father, we do pray now together that whatever hindrances may have risen up within our own hearts, maybe even in this moment rising up within our own hearts to receiving your word and the testimony regarding your son, Jesus Christ, anything that would keep us from seeing him for who he truly is and putting our hope and trust fully in him. Would you, by your sovereign grace, remove those? Give us eyes to see, spiritual eyes to see the truth and the glory and the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, maybe you've uh, heard the saying, familiarity breeds contempt. And I think if you try to take that saying sort of as an absolute rule or something that's true in every single situation, I think that would be just a little bit too harsh and a little bit too cynical. By, By God's grace, there are real ways in which your love or your appreciation for someone can really go, grow deeper and grow richer as you get to know them better. But as a proverbial saying, it does capture what is often true, at least in some aspect of our life and our uh, relationships. The more you know a person, uh, the greater frequency with which you interact with them, the greater variety of contexts w- within which you see them and and see the way they function, uh, that can sometimes cause or often cause it, your, your appreciation, your respect, your valuing of them to, to diminish in certain ways. For one thing, you, you just come to recognize how common and ordinary people really are <laughs> when you see them in all different aspects of their life. I think at the same time, even the maybe special strengths and virtues that, that people you're close to possess, when, when you become so familiar with that in your own life and experience and relationship with them, you can really stop appreciating them rightly. You begin to take them for granted. So, so maybe you have a, a, a really good friend who just so consistently speaks encouraging words into your life. And, and for a while, you really appreciate it, but then it becomes so consistent, it almost starts to fall on deaf ears, and you, and you don't really hear it anymore, at least not in the way that you should. You begin to take it for granted that every night at 6 p.m., delicious food appears on your table, and it doesn't just happen magically. That happens by someone planning and preparing and using their gifts to provide food for for you and and for your family, and you stop appreciating how glorious that actually is. You you might begin to take for granted the sacrifices of a family member that they make day after day and week after week in order to provide for your needs or, or to care for you in particular ways. If I just picked a completely random example, you know, maybe a teenager, the way they think about their parents. I'm sure it's happened maybe once or twice in the history of the world. And it's not just human relationships, it's also true of circumstances, right, and experiences. You, that, that view of the mountains or the ocean that you see that first day you arrive on vacation, and, and as the, the week, the days go on, it's not quite as impressive as it becomes familiar. I, I was thinking, it's interesting, you know, we live in the age of television, we live in the age of the internet, we have constant access to the most amazing sights and sounds all the time. <laughs> Just the click of a button and, and the best musical performances in any genre, I can have it instantly. Or, or these just vivid, incredible pictures of the most stunning aspects of our creation. Just look at them anytime that I want to. Astounding sports highlights the top 10 every single night of the week, these amazing feats, and it just starts to become sort of mundane, sort of normal, because I'm constantly exposed to what is truly amazing. 
and you begin to have trouble seeing and appreciating what's actually before you. You know, when it, when it comes to faith in Christ, there are actually many things that, be, that can become stumbling blocks to us seeing and appreciating and trusting in Christ the way that we should. And I think in our text this morning, we see two of them in particular, the familiarity of Jesus and the humility of Jesus. And and those can become real stumbling blocks to faith. When the glory of Christ's power and authority, we see it here, when they were displayed in his ministry, those from his hometown, they were actually offended. (laughs) They were scandalized rather than being humbled and amazed and led to trust in Christ as they should have. And then we, we... See, as our text goes on, as Jesus sends his disciples out into the world to proclaim his gospel, there's these similar dynamics at work in their ministry as well. Jesus makes clear, there's going to be some who are going to respond to you with offense. There's going to be some who respond to you with rejection at the ministry of these very common people as they proclaim the gospel. There are certainly some differences in our day from the particular circumstances of these verses, but there are also some principles that are so significant and abiding for us today, and I hope those will become clear as we go. So first of all, I just, I want to consider the stumbling block of familiarity, the stumbling block of familiarity. Remember, We've just come through this section of Mark's gospel where we've seen these stunning displays of Jesus' authority, right? His authority over nature, his authority over demons, his authority over sickness, his authority over death. And as we enter into chapter 6, Mark tells us that as, as Jesus was traveling, he's ministering in the various towns of Galilee, he now comes to his hometown. Mark doesn't give us the name of that hometown here, but he did earlier in chapter 1, verse 9, when he said that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. And so as Jesus uh, had developed as a custom, as he would enter a town, he goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. This is where the Jewish people would gather to read and to hear teaching on the Jewish scriptures. And Jesus begins to teach. And Mark states in verse 2, as we've seen it now in many instances, that many who heard him were astonished at his teaching. But here's the irony of this particular account. Their astonishment does not lead to respect and humility and faith so that they put their hope in the, the authority and the saving power of Christ. Instead, it leads to suspicion It it leads to condescension. It leads to offense and rejection. They clearly recognize something unusual is happening in the ministry of Jesus. But, But at least in part because of their past familiarity with Jesus and with his life, they're unable to appreciate Jesus for who he truly is. They knew Jesus as a boy. They know his family now. They know his mom. They know his sisters and his brothers. And they know these are just regular folks. It may be that Joseph is not mentioned here as Jesus' father. This is sort of the traditional explanation of this because Joseph had died at this point before Jesus' public ministry. It's hard to be absolutely certain. Even so... Calling a person the son of a woman in Jewish understanding was not common and probably indicates some form of disrespect. It may even hint at the illegitimacy of Jesus' birth, which we know from other scriptures was what some people thought about Jesus. It's hard to be certain, but, but whatever the precise intent of that statement Here's the main point. They were familiar with Jesus, and they were not impressed. 
They were familiar, and they were not impressed. They watched him grow up to become a carpenter. He served their little town with his manual labor. They know he never trained with a Jewish rabbi. His father was no religious scholar. So they ask, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? So again, here's what's so interesting. They know there's power. <laughs> they know there's authority of some kind. That can't be denied. They, you know, they don't go here explicitly, but I can't help but think back to, to the way the scribes responded to Jesus in Mark chapter 3. When the scribes could not deny Jesus' power over demons, what did they do? They refused to ascribe that power to God, and against all logic, they tried to ascribe it to demons. Well, well the people of Nazareth don't go that far, but, but I think there's a similar dynamic here. Even though we are astonished by this unusual power and authority, we will not ascribe it to God. Because this is the same common boy who grew up in our very midst in Nazareth. So their, their familiarity with Jesus, it blinds them to seeing the true glory of who he really is and keeps them from responding in faith. And, and Jesus calls them out for it, right? <clears throat> A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. Familiarity breeds contempt. Now again, I realize that the, cir- the, the specific circumstances here, they're very different from the circumstances we're in today. They were actually interacting with Jesus himself in his earthly ministry, and their familiarity was because he actually grew up in their hometown. But I think we need to realize there's a principle here where our familiarity with Jesus can keep us from responding in faith and seeing him rightly for who he really is. We don't see Jesus face to face, but most of us, I would say, especially this group here that's gathered in this room, we have remarkably frequent exposure and access to Jesus. We can read God's inspired testimony concerning his son any time that we choose in the scriptures. A word that we're told is living and active in the hearts of those who receive it. We know Christ through the preaching and teaching of his word. We experience the grace of Christ through the regular fellowship and ministry of the church that encourages us and gives us counsel as we seek to grow in our knowledge and in our relationship with Christ. We have the freedom to relate to Christ directly through prayer, anytime, individually, as well as as a group, as a church. We regularly, regularly celebrate the ordinances, right? Baptism and the Lord's Supper, which what? Serve as a display and a reminder of the power and the promises of Jesus Christ. So maybe you're here this morning and you have grown up around church your entire life, but you've never personally humbled yourself before him, repenting of your sins, asking him to save you personally, to give you the gift of eternal life. Maybe your familiarity is keeping you from from the real reckoning that's actually required of every single person within the world. Giving up control of your life, submitting yourself personally to Jesus and to his authority. Let me say a word to our children and our youth that are here this morning. We're so thankful for you. You gather with us week after week. We're with you as your families in our homes. And maybe as a youth or as a child, you've always, maybe your entire life from day one, You've been in church. You come to church, 
Maybe you even read your Bible, you pray, because it's just what your family does. That, that's all you ever have known. And it all feels very familiar. But maybe it's just a routine. Christ himself is not real to you. You're, you're familiar with him, but you don't personally know him for who he is. You don't trust him. You're not living in personal relationship with him as the living Lord of the universe and the only Savior of the world who calls you to trust him for your salvation, to obey him in your life. Fellow Christians, is your familiarity with Christ causing your appreciation of him to diminish so that you're not appreciating the immeasurable mercy that he has shown you to save you from an eternity of being separated from God? Are you appreciating the ongoing power that's being displayed in your life even today that keeps you from falling away? keeps you from trusting him, keeps you desiring to obey him in your life. That's a gift that Christ has given you. Are you failing to appreciate the work of his spirit through the church to shepherd you and to care for you and to provide for you spiritually? Are you failing to appreciate the very real authority that is gonna be fully displayed upon his return when every one of us will stand before him in judgment. We need to be on our guard, don't we? We, we need to examine our hearts so that familiarity does not actually become a stumbling block that keeps us from seeing Christ, from appreciating Christ, from hoping and trusting in Christ as we truly should. In addition to the stumbling block of familiarity, we also see here the, the stumbling block of humility, and I think these can be closely connected. I think they're closely connected in our text this morning because the more familiar that you become with a person, again, the more you may realize, at least in particular ways, like I said before, just how common they really are, just how ordinary they really are. And the reality is that Jesus, for all of his glory as the Son of God, he really did share in the common, ordinary aspects of our humanity. And this becomes a stumbling block for many. So, so when I speak of the stumbling block of humility here, I'm talking about the humility of Christ, the objective humility of his humanity, of his person, the fact that he shared a common humanity. More than that, that as a human, he lived a very common life, working a very common vocation in a very common town. And the faithless response of the people of Nazareth, it was driven in part by the fact that they recognized the genuine humility of Jesus' life. They were not impressed by this homegrown man who was in his early 30s. Certainly, he did not have the typical background for becoming a public teacher, a public leader in Israel. He did not have the background from their perspective of someone who could make an authoritative claim upon their lives. And we don't know a lot about Nazareth as a town, and that's part of the point. <laughs> it was a pretty obscure out of the way town. It's never mentioned in the Old Testament, not once. And when it does come up in the New Testament, it doesn't come up in the most positive light other than when it's associated with Jesus. But when Philip finds Nathaniel, you remember this, and he says, hey, we found the one that Moses and the prophets speak about. It's Jesus of Nazareth. And what does he say? Can anything good come from Nazareth? That's Jesus' hometown. It's interesting. One of the commentators I read made this connection. I thought it was, was, was interesting. When the Apostle Paul 
in Acts 21, 39, he's under duress. He wants to speak to the crowds in Jerusalem, and he makes his appeal to, to be uh, allowed to speak from the fact that he's from Tarsus in Cilicia. He's a citizen of no obscure city. Hey, I'm from a leading city, and I'm a citizen there, so you should let me speak. Jesus couldn't make that appeal. <laughs> He's from little, out-of-the-way Nazareth. He didn't go to an Ivy League school. He didn't train with the professionals. His family were common folk, the people like we, we know them. We know them personally. They, they especially highlight that he was a common carpenter. Verse 3, is not this the carpenter? Now, now, I don't think they mean by that that being a carpenter was in itself a dishonorable or, or disreputable trade. I just think they mean we would not expect a common carpenter to be the one that God sent to teach our nation how to relate to God. More than that, we would not expect a common carpenter to be the one that God would send to redeem and to rule over God's people. This is true humility. The, the commentator James Edwards, he points to the writings of a very outspoken critic of Christianity uh, writing in the second century. His name was Celsus. This is just decades after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And Celsus, in his writings, he scoffs at the fact that the founder of this new religion was nothing but, quote, a carpenter by trade. Couldn't believe it. New religion, this carpenter by trade. It's the same response of the people of Nazareth. They're offended by Jesus' humility. In reality, if they had been seeing things rightly, they should have been astonished and amazed that the Son of God would humble himself to share their humanity, much more to live in an obscure, out-of-the-way town with a common trade, and it should have humbled their hearts before him. And of course, brothers and sisters, visitors, we know from our perspective today, we know the humility of Jesus goes so much deeper than this. Not only was Jesus willing to share our humanity and live a common life, he was, he was willing for our salvation to humble himself even to the point of death, and not just death, but the death of a common criminal. Death, torturous death by crucifixion, bearing the sins of God's people as he suffered on the cross, though by his righteous life and divinity did not deserve it in any way. The, the, the humility of the cross, right? This has been one of the main stumbling blocks to faith for generations. Would God really save the world by having his own son die the death of a common criminal? It's easy to be offended. I think it's easy to be offended if we sung in stricken, smitten, and afflicted because of what it says about us, what it says about the reality of our sin and the cost that was required to forgive our sin. It's easy to be offended because of the humility of Christ. It's easy to be offended, you know what? Because he calls his disciples to follow in his steps and to humble ourselves in service, just as he has done for us. But if we will see Jesus rightly, we will be astonished at the glory of his humility, the glory of his sacrifice that he made for our salvation. 
You know, up until this point in Mark's gospel, by and large, the crowds, they have been amazed as they witness Jesus' authority. But here in Nazareth, it's Jesus who is amazed. Mark tells us in verse 6, Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. He marveled at the hardness of their hearts. He marveled at their spiritual blindness, refusing to acknowledge his true authority and identity as the Christ because Jesus was so humble and familiar to them. You know, I think the tendency of the world, maybe you've thought this in your own heart and mind, I think the tendency is to think that somehow God has failed to clearly make himself known to us. In some ways, God hasn't given us enough to go on. He, he has somehow held out on us. And if only he'd, he'd been willing to reveal himself to us more clearly, then we'd all believe in him. You know, the word of God does not have that perspective at all. God has revealed himself with amazing clarity in creation, in his spoken and written word, in the scriptures, and most supremely in the giving of his own son. He has revealed himself with remarkable clarity, and yet in the hardness of our hearts, we so often respond with what from God's perspective is stunning unbelief, shocking unbelief, unbelief that is without excuse. That's the perspective of God's word when we fail to trust and see Christ for who he is. And Mark states the consequences of that unbelief in verse 5. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And I'm thinking, that's pretty mighty. But, but, but broadly, the way he had been so consistently, so broadly healing and delivering people, he couldn't do it in Nazareth. Now, I, clearly the point is not Jesus didn't have the, the ability, right? He's God. He can do whatever he pleases. But this is a, a restraint that he places on himself. Jesus would not do a mighty work there because of their hardened unbelief. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't have been fitting because of the state of their hearts in relationship to him. Because the saving power and promises of Christ are received and experienced through faith. That's how God has designed it. So that he will be honored as we rightly trust and depend on him and then experience the glorious reality of his saving promises. So again, here's the question. Are you trusting Christ in that way? Or are you robbing yourself of the glory of his saving promises, the forgiveness of your sins, the hope of eternal life, his faithful presence and provision for you right now as you trust and follow him? Don't let the sin of unbelief rob you of the glory of Christ's saving power. So we've seen how the, the stumbling blocks of Christ's familiarity and humility can keep us from trusting in him as we should, from, from recognizing his true authority and saving power. Now, we move on from the response of the people of Nazareth to Jesus to the mission of Jesus' disciples as they're sent out in his name and they're sent out with his authority. And what we see is that there are going to be similar dynamics at work as his disciples go out into the world. And, and one of the first things we see here is the humble dependence of Christ's disciples. So we saw, we saw the humility of Christ. Guess what? His disciples are called to follow in his steps, and we see the humble dependence of Christ's disciples. Look at verse 7. And he called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits, 
He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Okay, again, we need to realize there are some unique things in terms of what's happening in this first mission of the 12 apostles. But again, there are some wonderful abiding principles for us to consider. I I think the point is not that missionaries can only be sent out in pairs, only two by two. I don't think that's what we're to take, although there's probably some significance to the fact that according to Jewish law, Valid testimony required at least two or three witnesses. I think that may be part of what's going on here. I think there's also just something to the the benefit and blessing of partnership, uh, of not serving alone, and certainly that is a value that we continue to consider today. I think the point is not that any time a follower of Christ is sent out on mission to share the gospel, then he or she must only wear one tunic, a belt, and sandals, and carry a staff. I was thinking of our missionaries boarding the plane with their staff as they get on. In fact, it's interesting, later on in in Jesus' ministry, when the hostility against him and his disciples are growing, he's actually going to say, now let the one who has a money bag take it. And likewise, the one who has a knapsack. So in other, th- in other words, things are heating up, and I want you to be prepared. So, so I don't think these are absolute rules. But there's some things to take away. The disciples, you, you, they were required by Jesus' command to live in humble dependence on the Lord, right? Humble dependence as they focus on their mission. Jesus wants them to learn that as they go on mission, the Lord is the one who will provide for their needs through people. Later on when Jesus is about to be crucified and the disciples were, were going to continue their ministry after his departure, he, he points their attention back to this moment. And you know what he says to them? He says, He asked them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack, did you lack anything? And they said, nothing. We did not lack anything that was truly needed for the mission that you gave us. The Lord was faithful. But as was the case with Jesus himself, Not everyone was going to be impressed by the ministry of these disciples. Some would not receive them. Some would not listen to them. That's how Jesus has designed the mission. It's through the faithful proclamation of humble, ordinary, dependent servants of Christ that the gospel goes forth in our neighborhoods and to the ends of of the earth. You know, in so many ways, the the disciples of Christ, you and me, again, we're called to follow in Jesus' steps and to reflect in our lives his ministry. And the power of our ministry, just like with the apostles, it's not going to be in our earthly possessions. It's not going to be in our political power. It's not going to be in our cultural influence. It's not going to be in our popular acclaim. These guys were not the most impressive people in the room. But they were to carry out their ministry from a place of humility and dependence upon Christ. And as they did so, the response would be mixed. Some would believe and some would not, just as the response to Jesus would be mixed. And brothers and sisters, The manner of the mission and the response, it's similar today. 
It carries on today. The way the gospel spreads to the world is through the proclamation of ordinary, humble, dependent disciples of Jesus. That's the, that's the plan. <laughs> we read earlier, right? Not, not many of you wise, according to the wisdom of the world. Not, not many of you powerful. Not, not many of you of noble birth. But those living by faith in humble dependence on Christ, focused on the mission he's given us to proclaim his gospel and to make disciples. And the world may not be impressed. In fact, some will, will not receive that ministry. Some will not listen to our message. Some will respond with contempt. Some will respond with persecution. But some will believe. Some will be saved forever from their sins. And the gospel will go forth to every nation, just as Christ has promised in his book, Evangelism as Exiles, a wonderful book. Elliot Clark, some of you know him. He opens with these words. He says, picture an evangelist. For many of us, our minds immediately scroll to the image of someone like Billy Graham. Love Billy Graham. Nothing against Billy Graham, but listen to what he says. A man maybe dressed in a suit and tie, speaking to a large audience and leading many to Christ. For as such, sorry, as such, we tend to envision evangelism as an activity, more commonly a large event that requires some measure of power and influence. In communicating the gospel, one must have a voice, a platform, and ideally a willing audience. It's also why to this day, we think the most effective spokespeople for Christianity are celebrities, high profile athletes, or other people of significance. If they speak for Jesus, the masses will listen. Will listen, once again, I'm glad for any celebrity to testify to the truth of Christ. I'm glad for any high-profile athlete to use that platform to testify to the truth about Christ. And guess what? God does sometimes save people in large crowds. And praise God that he does that. But that is not where the authority of our gospel is found. It's not in your place in society. It's in Jesus Christ who has entrusted you with a message that is true. And as you go out in his name and live in the way he's called you to and faithfully proclaim his message, yes, you are a humble, dependent servant, but guess what? You go out with the very authority of Christ. And that, that's the last thing I want you to see this morning. I want you to see the true authority of Christ's disciples. We've seen the humble dependence. I want you to see the true authority. We're told in verse 7 that Jesus gives the 12 apostles authority over unclean spirits. Again, down in verse 13, they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. I don't think there's anything magical about the oil. I think it's a symbol of God's blessing and favor and healing, which then in God's power led to actual healing. Again, I think there's some uniqueness here. These were the 12 apostles. Their ministry was foundational in terms of their testimony for the entire church. What God was doing in Christ, it was new and it was unique at this particular stage of redemptive, redemptive history. And so God worked in special ways to verify he was the one behind what was going on in the ministry of these apostles. And therefore, as Christ begins to send out the apostles in order to, to spread this foundational testimony. He commissions them with power, signs of miraculous power that verify the reality of their proclamation. Now, does God still work miracles today? Yes, I do believe he does. But we don't have the same guarantee 
the way Jesus sent out the apostles, that he will work in those ways. But here's what we do have, the same authority of their proclamation. Look at verses 10 and 12. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent, right? Same message all the way through Mark. Repent, the kingdom of God has come in Jesus Christ. Repent and put your hope in him. And so when the disciples entered a town They were to to depend on someone in the town, providing for them a place to stay, providing for them food to eat. This would be a sign of receiving their message and their ministry. But if no one would take them in because they rejected their ministry and rejected that gospel, what were the disciples to do? They were to shake off the dust from their feet, which would be a sign of judgment upon that town. Elsewhere in the Gospels, when uh, Jesus tells his disciples to perform this sign, you, you know what he says about that town against which this sign is performed? He says, I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. You know what happened to Sodom? It was destroyed by fire from heaven. And Jesus says, it's going to be worse for those who reject this gospel. In other words, I send you out with my authority and those who reject you reject me and reject my Father who sent me and his judgment will land with severity if there's not repentance. Second Thessalonians 2, 8 and 9, those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When we faithfully proclaim this apostolic gospel and people reject that proclamation, it is a rejection of the authority of Christ himself. That's a sobering word. It's also a word I hope that will give you a renewed confidence as you go into the world and proclaim this gospel, that it'll give you a renewed boldness that you go not on your own authority, but you go with the very authority of Jesus Christ. So may you live in humble dependence on him. May you faithfully proclaim his gospel in the world, and trust him to save many through our testimony. Let's pray that he'll do that. Father, once again, we pray first and foremost with regard to our own hearts, even as we began, that you would remove any stumbling blocks within us that would keep us from trusting and hoping in you. And Lord, that as we do that, that then there would be a renewed confidence and boldness as we are sent into the world as your disciples, as we speak to friends and family and neighbors and coworkers, as we send and go to the nations of the world, that we would go with boldness and confidence in your authority as we faithfully proclaim your gospel. And we ask this in your name, amen.